Hey everyone, so uh, welcome to uh, today's lecture in uh, Poly 205, International Politics, um, looking at uh, international organizations. All right, so what are international organizations? Um, well, they're uh, a set of uh, different institutions that include intergovernmental organizations, which are things like uh, the UN or the European Union, uh, non-governmental organizations, uh, which are things such as Médecins Sans Frontières or Amnesty International. Um, and so it's a, a wide grouping of different types of organizations. And we're going to spend most of the time today talking about intergovernmental organizations. Uh, but it's also important to remember that there's many, many different NGOs. There's thousands of different uh, NGOs uh, that are spread across the world. Um, and some of them play important roles uh, in uh, many different international events. Uh, so what are intergovernmental organizations then? Those are organizations whose members include at least three states that have activities in several states and whose members are held together by a former intergovernmental agreement, right? So if you just have two states that made an agreement together, it doesn't qualify as an intergovernmental organization. So if just Canada and the US make an agreement, um, you know, that may have legal status, but it doesn't qualify as an intergovernmental organization. Uh, it has to have activities in several states, right? So, uh, and its members are held together by a formal intergovernmental agreement, right? So uh, you need some type of agreement that holds, you know, these together. It can't just be a, an informal arrangement between three or more states. Uh, there has to be some form of uh, formalization. Uh, there's approximately 400 different independent intergovernmental organizations around the world, uh, covering a whole range of different topics and sizes and issue areas and uh, everything like that. We're not gonna obviously learn about all of them. Uh, today, we're just gonna focus on you know, some of the, the most prominent ones and uh, what they do. So um, to look at intergovernmental organizations, we need um, some tools, right? We need some ways to be able to organize them, um, to categorize them, with 400 different groups and then once you get into NGOs you're dealing with you know thousands of different groups not all of them are going to operate the same we're not going to see the same behavior we're not going to see the same power um, so we need some way of uh, organizing them and so here's uh, three different ways that we can potentially organize uh, intergovernmental organizations right so we can look at them in terms of size right and you see a huge different range here right for, for example you have tiny ones like uh, North America Free Trade Agreement or now the uh, US uh, MCA agreement uh, that it was recently replaced, but like NAFTA had three member states, uh, Canada, US, and Mexico. Uh, the Universal Postal Union, which is one of our oldest intergovernmental organizations, has uh, about 190 members, right? So that's a huge difference in terms of scope. And then you have organizations um, ranging from, you know, three all the way up to more than 190 um, and all sizes in, in between. Um, we can look at different geographic scope, right? And so we can look at organizations that are focused in uh, one region. So Organization of American States, which would be uh, focused in the Americas, or, um, you know, you'd have uh, the European Union in Europe, uh, and uh, APEC in Asia Pacific. Uh, so you, you'd have different organizations in, that are just regional focused. Uh, they don't deal with global issues, they deal with issues that are, are, are more focused. Uh, and then we have uh, many global uh, international organizations, right, that deal with issues that are across regions that, that span the entire world. So an example would be uh, the World Bank, the UN, um, and so these ones will have a larger geographic scope. And then different purposes, different international organizations try to do different things. Um, and here again, we can kind of categorize them based on, um, well, some try to do a little bit of everything. Some of your, particularly your biggest ones, um, will have kind of a general focus, right? The idea is just to bring together different members, and, but they're going to deal with multiple different topics. So um, the prominent one here would be the United Nations, uh, which deals with uh, many, many, many different issue areas. Um, but it's hard to create general purpose, particularly large organization. So most organizations are more limited in what they try to uh, deal with. So you have many specialized ones and they're focused in one um, or a few issue areas. 
So an example here would be the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, or OPEC, which deal with oil production quotas uh, and uh, kind of setting the oil prices. And it's just um, petroleum exporting countries that could be members. Um, and so it's, it's really dealing with that uh, only that topic or topics that are related to petroleum exporting. Um, if, you know, not to say that other topics are important, but they're beyond the purview of, let's say, a, a group like or an organization like uh, OPEC would deal with. Uh, they also have different functions, right? Uh, in, when we look at intergovernmental uh, organizations, we can see um, that they will do one or more of these different, uh, sort of more one or more of these different functions, right? Um, so some of them uh, will serve an informational role, which includes gathering, analyzing, and disseminating data, which is important, um, as we've talked about uh, with multiple theories that we've looked at before. Um, many problems that we find in international politics are, are stem from the fact that um, it's hard to gather information about you know the situation about what others are doing uh, and so internet governmental organizations by providing information can uh, help to solve many of these problems uh, they provide a, a function as a forum so providing a place for exchange of views and decision making so a place where you can have regularized discussions uh, between different parties on um, issues that may be important to them and uh, they can discuss uh, uh, views and, uh, and uh, you know, hopefully are able to reach decisions. Um, they can serve a normative role. And this is something uh, a lot, um, for example, that uh, a lot of constructivist literature um, might talk about the normative role in intergovernmental organizations, uh, defining standards of behavior, right? So what is appropriate in terms of behavior um, for people to do? Um, they serve a rule creating function, drafting legally binding treaties. Uh, so they can define standards of behavior in more kind of a, a sociological, um, this is the way appropriate way to behave, but they can also create um, international law. Um, rule supervisory. Um, so after rules have been created, um, you need someone who can actually monitor or states actually um, complying with the agreement. Um, and so the intergovernmental organization is often well placed to monitor compliance with rules, um, settle disputes, and take enforcement measures. Um, now, monitoring compliance is often the easiest of these three, and that followed by settling disputes and enforcement um, is oftentimes very difficult, even for uh, the best intergovernmental organizations. Um, but this is one of the goals of, um, of IGOs. Operational. Um, so allocating resources, providing technical assistance, relief, and supplying forces. Many IGOs um, they actually do things too, right? So, uh, you know, the UN will, might deploy peacekeepers or, um, uh, you know, provide uh, um, help on the ground. Uh, and this can be really useful in terms of, A, providing resources in areas where it's needed and can, can sometimes do it very quickly. But also many countries that uh, may be members of intergovernmental organizations who are um, experiencing problems, um, oftentimes they have a technical deficiency, right? Or they may not have much state capacity. Um, they may not have experts in the relevant areas. And then IGO can come in uh, and bring in experts from around the world um, who are able to um, solve those problems, right? So you can ha definitely have, uh, you know, and particularly in a lot of less developed countries where you do see um, uh, lower capacity, state capacity or lower expertise in, in many different areas, the IGO can send in technical experts to, to help. All right, so I want to look at uh, one global purpose IGO um, because it's one that uh, is of high prominence in, uh, in international politics um, and that's the United Nations. So we're going to look a little bit about at its history and its uh, membership, um, what it does and its structure. And then we'll move on to um, some specialized or more uh, restricted ones. So this one's interesting um, because it's a global and general purpose, right? So it's bringing together the whole world and all issue areas. Um, so the United Nations was founded in 1945 with all peace-loving nations eligible for membership. And I put peace-loving in uh, quotes because uh, the way that peace loving at the time was defined was pretty much, you know, winners of World War II, 
Um, if you lost World War II, you are not at that time a peace-loving nation. If you won World War II, uh, you are pretty much eligible to be considered a peace-loving uh, nation. Um, as it's common with many international organizations, particularly the large international organizations uh, that are founded in the wars, um, they take on the shape of what you know the victors desire. Uh, and so you definitely see the imprint of the previous war on the structure of the organization. So there's currently about 193 member states. Um, now, since World War II, the United Nations has been the central police of global governance, right? As the global general purpose IGO, it's the one that's most publicly visible, um, usually. Uh, it's the one where we put kind of the highest hopes in terms of uh, solving many problems because it's the only IGO with global scope and newly uh, universal membership, right? So it's the only organization that can bring together um, everybody at the same time and that uh, can uh, cover all of the different issue areas, not just one, but can you know, look at uh, international politics in a more holistic manner. The establishment of the United Nations in the closing days of World War II um, was the affirmation of uh, the desire of war weary nations for an organization that could help them avoid future conflict. Uh, and we see this at the end of many great wars, many of the kind of the largest wars that at the end of the war, um, countries are tired from the war and they, they want to find a, you know, an organization or they want to find a way that can help them with you, uh, avoid future conflict. So we see this with the UN after World War II. We saw this uh, with the uh, the League of Nations after World War One and the concert of Europe after the Napoleonic Wars. Um, so, uh, and in many important ways, the structure of the United Nations was patterned after that of the League of Nations, right? So we kind of took what we had learned uh, from the successes of the League of Nations where they existed, you know, what seemed to work, but also the League of Nations had many failures. So in designing the United Nations, kind of try to take from you know the best of what the League of Nations accomplished while avoiding the worst failures. Um, so there definitely was you know some evidence of learning, uh, particularly in terms of um, the Security Council and uh, the permanent membership in the Security Council for the permanent five. Um, so let's look at some of the key principles that uh, make up the, the backbone of uh, the United Nations. The first is the principle of sovereign equality of member states, right? So that means that uh, on its face, all member states are equal to each other. So there's none that are above, none that are below, right? And that's based on the, pro the principle of sovereignty. It doesn't matter whether you're large or small, uh, small um, all member states are sovereign over their territory. Uh, and that means that they should be treated as equal. Um, now, interestingly, when we'll look at some structures, not all members are always completely equal within the UN, um, but this was important. Uh, some of these kind of deviations were important for other principles. Um, twin principles of peace and security. So all member states shall refrain from threat of, um, or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state or in any manner inconsistent with the United Nations purposes and settle their international disputes by peaceful means. So if a dispute arises between different states to use peaceful means and never issue any threat to the use of force against the territorial integrity or political uh, independence of any states, right? So at its core, um, well, the United Nations does many, many, many different things um, because it was created um, at the end of World War II to try to avoid war. At its, at, at its core, its primary goal is peace, right? Um, it, um, where it's different from some of the organizations that whose primary goal is peace is that um, after the failures of the League of Nations, uh, the creators of the UN realized that if you want to maintain peace, you can't just be dealing with military security, right? Uh, maintaining peace and security requires bringing together um, economic and social issues as well. Um, there's an obligation built in to support enforcement action. So if there is a breach to the peace, um, all members are technically obligated to um, help in enforcement actions uh, to the best of their abilities. Um, and so the best of their abilities is run in the principle of good faith effort to fulfill all, all obligations, right? But doesn't mean that uh, all states will always be successful in fully living up to the terms of, um, you know, the UN charter or UN decisions, but they must put in place a good faith effort, 
effort to get there. Um, so they, they have to try their best. Non-intervention in domestic affairs. Um, so nothing in the present charter. Um, so this is a quote from the Charter of the United Nations. Nothing in the present charter shall authorize the United Nations to intervene in matters which are essentially within the domestic jurisdiction of any state or shall require the members to submit such matters to settlement under the present charter. All right, so this kind of fits within the sovereign equality. Um, while um, the United Nations deals with international issues, um, it doesn't, isn't supposed to be dealing with um, purely domestic issues because states are sovereign over what happens in their, this territory. Um, now, there's a lot of tension over this point, right? Because um, some states um, hold very, very strongly to this principle. Um, but other states find, have found that there needs to be exceptions here, right? In the terms, uh, you know, if there's a humanitarian crisis in the state, if the state is, uh, you know, abusing its people, if there's a genocide or ethnic cleansing within a state, um, you know, many interventions that we've seen through the UN, have, uh, particularly kind of more recent ones, um, have involved some element of interference in, or intervention in domestic affairs under the idea that you know, by mistreating the people to a certain extent, uh, the, uh, the uh, government has given up uh, it, its right for uh, to claim non-intervention. Um, but, uh, and this is done through kind of some of the principles relating to um, the rights of people um, that are built into the Charter um, and uh, human rights documentation within the United Nations. Uh, but we definitely see some tension here, right? Um, do you have the right to interfere in a civil war if you're not invited? Do you have the right to interfere in a genocide if you're not invited? And then Article 51, which is like kind of the core of um, some of the, uh, the self-defense or the this is a security organization, um, but it's also a principle that many other security organizations, particularly NATO, have pointed to many times, is the right of individual or collective self-defense, right? So if attacked, although, an attack is always against, since an attack is always against the UN Charter, um, states have the right of individual or collective self-defense. So if Canada is attacked, Canada has the right to defend itself, but it also has the right to have friends help defend itself, right? So collective self-defense. So the United States or other NATO members could come to Canada's defense too. And this is the principle that uh, NATO has invoked for many of its different interventions, the, uh, the principle of collective self-defense. So this is the United Nations um, system, the uh, kind of a structure. Um, so on the left here, we have the principal organs, right? these six principal organs that make up the United Nations. And under each of these different principal organs, you have a variety of different uh, agencies and bodies. Um, obviously, you're not going to have to memorize all of these. This is just to try to show a little bit of the scope of everything that the UN uh, tries to handle. Um, you should. Definitely, and we're going to go more in detail onto the uh, UN principal organs. So you should definitely memorize all of those and a little bit of what they do and take a look at the different uh, organs and agencies and stuff like that, or, or bodies and agencies. Um, but uh, you, you certainly don't have to, to memorize um, all of these. All right, so that's kind of an introduction, uh, you know, a very quick introduction to uh, the United Nations. Now we're going to turn to the Regional General Purpose IGO. So before we're looking at a um, global general purpose organization, now we're going to focus on a regional one. So, uh, and for that, we're going to look at the European Union. Um, because the European Union is it, always an interesting case study because it's managed to accomplish um, deeper integration than any um, other um, international organization in the world. And it's been, done many things that, you know, many people never really thought possible uh, in terms of kind of getting to an organization that uh, where states really give up some of their sovereignty. It's almost a supranational um, organization that's above states and has some level of sovereignty. So this is a kind of map of the territory covered by uh, United Nations. It's actually no longer accurate um, because of uh, the UK which is uh, the Brexit um, actually occurred. Um, it's not a member, but the rest of this um, would be accurate. Um, so we've got the dark blue are current members. 
Uh, the slightly lighter blue are official candidates. So these are states that are on the pathway to becoming um, members of the uh, uh, European Union. And then there's kind of the very light blue are those recognized as potential uh, candidates. So ones who aren't on kind of the official pathway, who don't have official steps and negotiations. Oftentimes these states are um, the ones where official candidates are given kind of um, goals they must reach or reforms they must make before they actually can uh, become members. Uh, and once they accomplish those, then they could be, they, they could be brought in as, as, as members. Um, and the recognized as potential candidate, they're, they're still further off. Um, so the two recognized as potential candidates, um, they, so you've got Bosnia and, uh, and uh, Kosovo. Uh, so Kosovo, some of its problems may be related to recognized as statehood. Um, Bosnia's major um, obstacles, I believe, were related to um, subnational organizations having control over weaponry uh, and kind of having separate military forces, which Bosnia has been moving to resolve in, in creating a united military force um, for all of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, so that may help them upgrade. And most of the ones that are official candidates are in kind of the Balkans region, other former Yugoslav republics in particular. Um, Croatia has already become a member um, and, uh, and Turkey. And Turkey's actually had a very long and fraught negotiations with the European Union. It's gone back and forth. Many debates as to whether, you know, even if Turkey meets all of the requirements set out by the EU, whether it would ever be given membership. Um, that's hard to know. It's also hard to know with, you know, with Brexit happening and um, some negative turns in some of the EU members in terms of their democratic credentials, thinking of, you know, countries like, uh, like Hungary, um, which definitely, or, you know, and there's others that have definitely taken steps backwards in terms of their level of democracy. Um, it's, it'll be interesting to see whether this is going to put um, a little bit of a hold on some of the, you know, the, whether, you know, these states want to or are uh, want to join the EU or are accepted into the EU. Um, we'll also see whether you see, you know, um, particularly right after the Brexit vote, there's a lot of debate whether other countries were going to um, leave too. Um, the short-term answer has been no, um, but we'll see what ends up happening, particularly if we fall into another deep recession, um, which, you know, could end up leading to some type of crisis for the EU if they can't manage it. Um, we'll also see what the, the COVID-19 fallout is, whether um, people assess that was the, UN, or was the EU effective in dealing with it, or, you know, did states just go back to their national self-interest? Um, so those are all questions that moving forward, the EU is going to have to look at. Um, I know, like, for example, in, in uh, Serbia, which is a, a, an official candidate, uh, many people there have, you know, complained that during the COVID-19 crisis, uh, you know, they got their help not from the European Union, but from China. Um, and the European Union, you know, dealt only with, you know, Germany dealt with German problems, or France dealt with France problems uh, and whatnot. So we'll see. If you know, that changes support for the EU. So this is a kind of a map of the uh, EU power structure uh, with um, a separation between the legislative branch in yellow, executive branch in blue, and judicial branch in, in gray. Um, and the arrow is kind of pointing to who, you know, points who, who decides on what. Um, one of the really interesting and unique things about the European Union um, is here. Right? Um, people, so the usual pathway for how people have an influence on intergovernmental organizations, at least in democracies, is this pathway. People vote in national governments and then national governments act on, uh, or national parliaments and national governments act on intergovernmental organizations, right? So. The representatives to the United Nations, for example, aren't directly chosen by people. They're, you know, chosen, they're members of the government who will appear, uh, you will be uh, in 
ambassadors to the UN or national leaders will speak at the General Assembly. Uh, and um, so some have critiqued that there's kind of a democratic deficit, the people themselves don't really have much say in how uh, intergovernmental organizations are run. Um, particularly in non-democratic states, um, the people have no say in how intergovernmental organizations are run because their national leaders aren't representing the will of the people in that country. So uh, at least in democracies, you have, in theory, that the governments are representing the will of the people, but whether that actually takes place is, is sometimes questionable. Um, but in non-democratic uh, countries, that's you know, highly, highly questionable. Um, what's different with the European Union is, yes, there still is the national governments still have a say, right, in terms of operating through the European Council, the Council of Ministers. Um, and so it's not to say that, you know, national leaders and um, uh, don't have any say. The European Council would be made up of uh, heads of different heads of government or heads of state. Uh, Council of Ministers is made up of different ministers depending on the issue, right? So if it's an economic issue, it would be uh, ministers related to the economy. If it's security, it would be, you know, uh, ministers of national defense, um, so governments. But the European Parliament is direct is elected directly by the people. Um, so there are European elections that are completely separate from national elections um, where people vote in who their ministers or uh, the members of the European Parliament will be. Um, and so there's, you know, European political parties. Um, and so these are separate from national elections. And those, so those members of the European Parliament don't sit in any national parliament or national governments. Uh, their role is purely within the European Union. And they play a role in the legislation that makes up the European, uh, you know, the, in the making of rules, or pan-European rules. Um, so in terms of democracy, this is fundamentally different where people have an indirect route, but also a direct route into uh, making decisions in the European Union, which is a really different um, and interesting um, uh, innovation in, in structure. So that kind of concludes looking at uh, the European Union. Um, I want to turn a little bit to collective security organizations. So we've already talked a bit about them because the UN is a collective security organization um, at its core. Um, but I want to focus a little bit about what, what does a collective security organization mean? What are the different types? Um, we'll look at some examples. Uh, so what is first collective security? Um, it rests on the notions of all against one. While states retain considerable autonomy over the conduct of the foreign policy, participants in the collective security, or, uh, collective security organization fails a commitment by each member to join a coalition to confront any aggressor with opposing predominant strength. So the idea is that um, in a collective security organization that if an attack on one is kind of an attack on all. So if um, while you know a, a state may be strong enough to attack another state, it's not strong enough to attack the entire international community or all, probably not, or if international community was a global one or all members of the region. So if a state knew that if it attacked another state, it would only be fighting that state, but be fighting all other members of the collective security organization, the desire to attack or uh, should go down. You actually may still desire to attack, but your decision to attack is much less likely because if you're looking at the prospects of success, it's much less, much less likely because you're going to be faced with preponderant strength. Um, so it would take a very, very, very strong state to be able to, you know, go against all other states. So advantages, in theory, collective security makes for far more rust, robust deterrence by ensuring that aggressors will be met with an opposing coalition that's preponderant rather than merely equivalent power, right? So. If the threat, if you're threatening a state and the threat back is all of us are going to attack you if you attack us, um, well, then that's a really strong threat of punishment. Um, and so you may be much, you, you, it's, um, much less likely in theory that states will be willing to use it or be willing to, to attack given the knowledge that or the threat that there's this massive coalition that would oppose them. And 
by institutionally notion of all against one contributes to the creation of an international setting in which stability emerges through cooperation rather than through competition. If you, members of the collective security organization believe that deterrence is so strong that war becomes very unlikely, then they can ditch kind of policy making based on competition and just can just work together to strengthen the organization because they no longer fear each other. If anything, they want other members of the group to be strong because it makes the deterrent um, stronger. Just that so long as nobody becomes preponderant in strength all by themselves, that kind of a hegemon um, arises. Um, but given that that's unlikely, um, you can solve different disputes or everything uh, or different issues to cooperation rather than competition. So that's a goal that it could just lead to not only less war, but just a more cooperative international uh, community. Um, what are uh, the different types of collective security organization? Uh, so they could take on many different institutional forms along the continuum ranging from ideal collective security to concerts. And we'll look at what each, what ideal collective security and concerts are. Uh, you should rem uh, remember that these are kind of pure types, particularly ideal collective kind of like an ideal type, so it's not necessarily saying that we're ever going to see one of this, but it's kind of the, most of the different organizations we'll see are kind of somewhere in the middle. Um, uh, so these organizations vary as to the number of members, geographic scope, and the nature of the commitment to collective action. So ideal collective security at one end of the spectrum is participation of all states of the world, covers all regions of the world, and involves a legally binding and codified commitment on the part of all members to respond to aggression whenever and wherever it might occur. Um, so even the UN doesn't reach the standard that uh, legally binding codified commitment on the part of all member states to respond to aggression. While well, states are supposed to do the best they can, it's hard to say that it, it, it reaches that standard. Um, participation in the UN is near universal, but not necessarily uh, universal. Um, so the UN comes close, but um, even in the UN, there's been, in, under the UN system, there's been many t wars where you didn't see uh, the UN responding. So there's been many, many acts of aggression where we didn't see preponderant force on behalf of the UN responding. Um, and so even the UN doesn't meet this standard. Uh, for an ideal collective security, it would have to be any time there's any aggression, uh, you have an automatic response of the other member states to come to the defense of the one that's been attacked. Concert flies at the other end of the continuum. They represent the most uh, attenuated or simple or weakest form of collective security. Um, uh, though predicated on the notion of all against one, membership in a concert is restricted to the great powers of the day. A small group of major powers agree to work together to resist aggression. Uh, they meet on a regular basis to monitor events and if necessary to orchestrate collective initiatives. Concert's geographic scope is flexible. Members can choose to focus on a specific region or regions or to combat aggression on a global basis. Finally, a concert entails no binding or codified commitments to collective action. However, the decisions are taken through uh, informal negotiations through the emergence of consensus. So this is much weaker, where the other, uh, with ideal, it's legally uh, uh, binding a treaty um, requiring military response or requiring a collective defense. Here it's not legally binding. Uh, it's not all states involved. It's just the great power. So there'll be a discussion based on it. Um, what are the um, disadvantages of a concert? Um, well, I, in, in many ways, some of the kind of the, the perks of, it, you know, deterrence uh, that you have in an ideal collective security just aren't, aren't there. There's not necessarily the knowledge of a state that if you attack, you'll be met with a preponderance of force. So the deterrent threat isn't quite as strong. Um, the advantage is its flexibility um, that uh, states are more likely to be willing to join a concert knowing that there's not uh, anything legally binding. Anytime a concert fails to act, it doesn't invalidate the entire organization where if in an ideal collective security, um, organization was to fail to act, it kind of weakens uh, the entire organization and may destroy the entire organization where the concert, because there's no legally blinding, it's flexible, um, 
that uh, it can make its decisions uh, based on wh what it wants. Um, and so one failure isn't really a failure. Um, focus on the major powers um, of the day. Um, so it's also not like defending everyone. So the major powers are really more trying to restrict war between themselves. Um, whether they go to war with minor powers, um, they may discuss if it's, you know, within their region, um, but there's no protection given to minor powers. Um, and actions taken by the major powers outside of the region is something that is usually left out of the conflict. So the main example of conflict that we often talk about is the conflict of Europe, which took place at the end of the Napoleonic Wars. So the great powers in Europe after the Napoleonic War wanting to avoid fighting each other. Um, so it's kind of agreement to discuss and consult with each other um, over any kind of events taking place in Europe uh, and try to solve it between themselves so that they could avoid war. Um, outside of Europe, the states were pretty much free to do whatever they wanted so they could expand in colonization. Um, the country of Europe was actually quite successful. There were relatively few instances of war um, between uh, 1815 and uh, 1914 um, within European context, um, which would lend you know, some credibility to the idea of concert. Um, but it's also important to remember that during that time, uh, the uh, European great powers were, or major powers, were also um, pursuing uh, colonies outside of Europe. So rather than using war within Europe to gain resources that they needed, they could gain these resources by just expanding their colonial holdings. And there was plenty, to, you know, plenty of colonies that they could still grab up. So they didn't even necessarily have to come into much contact with each other outside um, so uh, they could gain their resources through other means. If there were no possibility of gaining colonies outside, would have the concert of Europe worked as well? Um, it, it, I mean, we, we don't, there's no way of knowing for sure, but it's, it's a good question to at least ask. Um, the concert will obviously break apart at any point when, you know, great, major powers decide that they don't want to work together uh, to resist aggression if they decide, oh, you know, maybe war's not such a bad idea. Um, but in any case, in any collective security organization, if enough of the great powers decide that war's a good idea or it's an ideal collective security or concert, that organization's in trouble. And then finally, I want to talk about um, another regional one, uh, but it's one that's important for, um, A, it's just been a successful and long running organization. Uh, it's one that's still operating today, um, and it's one where Canada is a member, so uh, it's an interesting one to look at. Uh, so the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. So US-led military alliance formed in 1949, with mainly Western European members to oppose and deter Soviet power in Europe, right? So its main goal at its formation was we had, you know, it was formed at the uh, early parts of um, the Cold War, and it's, the goal was to keep um, the Soviet Union and its allies, so to keep the Soviet Union, the Warsaw Pact, or eventual Warsaw Pact, um, out of Western Europe. Um, so there's fears that they would try to expand and take over Western European states, um, and so uh, in particular, the Western Europeans wanted a, a way to, you know, keep the U.S. Uh, tied to them and tied to defending them. Uh, so it's a collective defense organization headquartered in Brussels, Belgium, and the Supreme Allied Commander is always an American general. So the Supreme Military Commander of NATO is always an American. Um, Article 5, which is the... Uh, Kind of the backbone of uh, of NATO as a, as a collective security organization. Uh, the parties agreed that an armed attack against one or more of them in Europe or North America shall be considered an attack against all, and consequently, they agreed that if such an armed attack occurs, each of them, in exercise of the right of individual or collective self-defense, recognized by Article 51, so returned to Article 51 of the Charter, the United Nations, will assist the party or parties so attacked by taking forthwith individually and in concert with the other parties 
such action as it deems necessary, including the use of armed force to restore and maintain the security of the North Atlantic area. So invoking the right of individual or collective self-defense, which is enshrined in the United Nations Charter, um, saying that if there's an attack against one member of NATO, it's considered to be an attack against all the different members. And so all other members are required to respond and help to maintain the territorial integrity and come to the self-defense of the attacked um, state. Uh, so the idea here would be that, you know, uh, it was thought that the Western European states were the most vulnerable to attack. So if the Soviet Union were to attack a Western European state, Article 5 state, that all other members, uh, and most notably the United States, uh, was obligated to come to the self-defense. Of um, Now, interestingly, while it was always assumed that uh, this provision would be used to bring the United States into defending um, Western Europe. Uh, the only time Article 5 was in, Article 5 was invoked was after the United States was attacked on 9-11. Um, so um, interestingly, it was only invo invoked when the, the only time it was ever invoked was when the United States was attacked. Uh, although you could actually make the argument that it, the fact that it was only had to be invoked after a terrorist attack um, maybe shows the strength of the commitment and, um, that, you know, part, you know, you could make an argument, it's impossible to know whether it's true that, you know, the strength of NATO is what made it so that Article 5 never had to be invoked uh, within Western Europe. Um, but uh, we, we couldn't know what history would look like without Article 5. Um, now, Article 5 has kind of been at the core of, uh, of NATO since its inception, and it's something that leaders of different countries have, you know, backed up and re-pledged their commitment to. Uh, so it was very noteworthy early in uh, President Trump's presidency when he was uh, less committal towards Article 5 and uh, certainly less committal towards the, uh, uh, you know, collective self-defense. Why should uh, Americans die for... Uh, the uh, war-hungry Montenegrins. Um, somehow Montenegro became a war-loving uh, country in President Trump's eyes. Um, and uh, now he's gone back and forth and sometimes has come closer to, you know, defending the Article 5 principle, but it certainly raised a lot of eyebrows when an American president was much less committal on Article 5. Uh, Cold War membership, so membership of uh, the uh, of NATO. So it's starting in 1949 with the states, so mainly Western Europe, but also Canada and the United States. 1952, Greece and Turkey, um, which is an interesting pairing given that the, their NATO members who have actually fought wars against each other. Uh, 1955, Germany joined as West Germany and it merged with East Germany in 1990. And in 1982, we had Spain join. Um, now, what's one of the more interesting topics related to NATO, so, um, you know, the Cold War membership fits easily and is easily explained within the context of the Cold War. You had the, kind of the, the two major blocks. You had the NATO bloc, the Western bloc, and you had um, the, uh, the Warsaw Pact and the Soviet Union, so the Eastern bloc. Um, and so you had kind of your two different alliance structures. Um, but what's one of the more interesting topics related to NATO is what's happened since the end of the Cold War. Um, because many argued that NATO, once the Soviet Union threat went away, NATO would go away. It was an organization created to counter NATO, and so, uh, sorry, to counter the Soviet Union. So when you have no Soviet Union, there's no more reason for, uh, for NATO. In fact, you know, some would have thought that you'd start seeing increased tension between, with the decline of Russia, you'd start seeing increased tension among say, you know, some Western European states and potentially against the, and potentially the United States, um, kind of in a re-power balancing. But in fact, what we end up seeing is that NATO has continued to expand um, in, in two different manners. It's continued to expand in terms of membership, pushing east, um, and in terms of its mission expansion. So it's also taken on new missions. So in 1999, we saw the addition of the Czech Republic, Hungary, and Poland. 2004, extension to Bulgaria, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Romania, Slovakia, and Slovenia. 
in 2009, Albania and Croatia, and in 2017 to Montenegro. Um, and so we saw it pushing into the Eastern Bloc, taking up many of the former Eastern Bloc states and getting closer and closer to, um, we're getting closer and right up against Russia's border. So this was definitely a point of contention between uh, the West and Russia in the 1990s in particular and the early 2000s was um, here's this security organization that uh, its whole kind of forming purpose was to counter the Soviet Union and now it's pushing right up against Russia's borders. Uh, and so to Russia, seeing this and seeing that, you know, NATO still seems to be poised against Russia and Russia has lost its buffer. Um, it used to have kind of satellite states, part of the Warsaw uh, Pact, um, Eastern Bloc states that were buffers against, you know, Soviet Union or Russia itself. Uh, and now you've got, you know, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania right on the border. Um, with Russia, and so that's definitely a, an increased um, threat to uh, to Russia. So that's certainly a point of contention. Um, also, a mission expansion. Um, so because uh, you know NATO's primary mission was to counter the Soviet Union, it needed a new mission. It needed something new to do, uh, and so it's expanded its mission to not only still maintain the territorial integrity of you know the member states but also security for promotion of democracy and human rights. So kind of the idea that you're not going to have um, global security um, without democracy and human rights. So it's kind of NATO's prime if it wants peace to uh, promote democracy and human rights. Uh, it also involved participation in missions outside of NATO territory. For example, Bosnia, which was certainly a very um, uh, contentious decision that got, uh, you know, a lot of opposition from states, uh, particularly larger states outside of NATO, saying, how can NATO be claiming the right to collective self-defense in a territory that's not uh, that of a member state? Um, so NATO would essentially made the claim that Article 51, the right to collective self-defense, uh, doesn't require that the defended state um, you know, be a, a NATO member uh, so that it could go wherever it wanted in, on the principle of collective self-defense. So it's participated, so it's expanded its mission to different missions, so promote, promotion of democracy and human rights. And it's also expanded its mission geographic scope, so not just within uh, NATO territory, uh, but also outside of NATO territory. And then just quickly one uh, slide on a non-governmental organization. We spent uh, the past time talking about uh, intergovernmental organizations. Uh, so what do non-governmental organizations do? Uh, they provide uh, voluntary organizations whose members are individuals or associations that come together to achieve a common purpose. Some organizations are formed to advocate a particular cause. So we call these like advocacy groups, uh, such as human rights, peace, or environmental. Others are established to provide services such as disaster relief, humanitarian aid in war torn societies or developmental assistance. Um, so many of them are just, uh, you know, that you think of uh, Amnesty International, the Red Cross has national chapters, but it also has kind of an international confederation of these different uh, national ones. And um, so it's important to remember the kind of the, the, the two main, now some organizations will do both advocacy and service, and some will be focused more on one. So um, many of them will have a cause and they're going to advocate. So, you know, you've got environmental protection, uh, NGOs that uh, are big in trying to advocate for changes in policies. So they're going to take actions to put pressure to try to change policies. Um, others are more related to doing things. So to help bring capacity to areas that don't have capacity. So, when, you know, when there's disaster relief, we'll send people in to help with the cleanup. Uh, if there's, if there's a war-torn society, they're going to help bring in themselves humanitarian aid. Um, because some, oftentimes the humanitarian aid from states may not be forthcoming or may be slow. Um, so international civil society, people, uh, organizations acting on behalf of people will bring in humanitarian aid uh, or developmental assistance will help actually go on the ground and help bring in technical expertise, help bring in material, 
um, to help uh, countries develop. Uh, there are thousands of NGOs um, dealing with so many different issue areas of different sizes, scopes, um, and, uh, and performing different services. Uh, and like, yeah, like IGOs, diff uh, the different geographic scopes and uh, functions that they serve. All right, that concludes uh, our uh, lecture on international organizations. Um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to uh, comment uh, or uh, send an email. Um, we'll also be able to on, uh, have a discussion on Zoom where we'll, we can talk through any questions or, uh, you might have about international organizations or about international politics. Um, so. I'll post uh, another video for the next topic uh, soon, so keep your eyes open for that, and uh, have a great day.